Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to A Cup of Hope with Hope Against Trafficking and the Michigan Abolitionist Project. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items that you know how to participate in today's event. You're listening using your computer speaker system by default. If you'd like to join over the phone instead because you're having trouble hearing, go ahead and just hit telephone and the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to our panelists by typing in your questions to the question pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them throughout our session today. Um, I do want to ask a quick question. Can, ever, can anybody see our uh, panelists yet? Because I'm not sure if, you can, if I've shown him yet. If you can type it in the chat, that would be great. Somebody's typing in the chat, so maybe they can't see you guys. Let me. Okay, can you guys see the chat? Can you see everybody now? Hopefully, you guys can type it in the chat or raise your hand in the question. Okay. Hang on, I'm getting questions and stuff. <laughs> Um, okay, she can, uh, Julia said she can see, so everybody can see. Thank you very much for letting us know that. Um, I appreciate it. Um, so I'd like to go ahead and welcome today's panelists. Um, first, we have Tracy Cavelligan, who is the new executor, executive director for Hope Against Trafficking, if you want to wave, Tracy. Um, then we have Hannah, who's the director of education for Hope Against Trafficking. And then we have Emily Johnson, who's the program coordinator for the Michigan Abolitionist Project. And Shelby McLean, community development coordinator, also from the Michigan Abolitionist Project. Thank you, ladies, for joining us. So I have to say I'm really excited to have this opportunity to come together and sort of hang out and sort of share a cup of coffee and talk about what's going on right now, given that you know, this is really unprecedented times and um, with the COVID-19 and the shelter in and the kids being home from school and um, there's just, there's just a lot to talk about and I'm just really excited to be able to be here with you guys to talk about some important things. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's why yeah. I wanted to do this panel um, because, uh, you know, just because society seems like it's come to a bit of a halt right now, uh, human trafficking has not and sexual uh, online exploitation has not come to a stop. And actually this is um, an easier time than ever for uh, online perpetrators to um, access kids who are just home all day and on their devices. So we found it very important to have this conversation with especially parents um, to just shine some light on how we can keep our kids safe online. Right. I mean, Emily is so important because, I mean, I have four kids and they range from sixth grade to 12th grade and they, you know, I'm working and they're working and I don't have the opportunity to see what they're looking at. They're supposed to be on a Zoom video with their teacher. And then they have an assignment that they have to put in. And the next thing you know, <laughs> I'm going in there and they're on some website because it's not always apps, you know, that we have to be aware of. There's these websites out there that they can be talking to strangers and talking to people. So it's, like, oh my goodness, you know, um, you you have the sense of security at school because they have all of the, all of their, um, especially with all of their computers and their website, they have these special guidelines on there, but at home, uh, it's a little more difficult to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important too that we're taking this time to have conversations that are going to then empower parents specifically at their homes. I'm not a parent myself, but I'm an aunt. And so I can empathize with that feeling of wanting um, only good things and healthy things for those uh, sweet kids. So um, I'm just excited to have a conversation with parents that shows that knowledge is a gift and that we're not trying to spread fear or anything. Like there's already enough fear and unknowns in this time, but we're gonna be able to um, you know, move past uh, the fear and, and even ignorance of things, but to move into knowledge because it's a gift. It's good. Right. And that's why this is a cup of hope because we're giving out hope 
that even though there's these predators out there, we are, if we are having the knowledge and the awareness, we can actually have a good relationship online with our kids and they know they can't be scared of something, but we got to give them the ability to know how to um, navigate, you know, with the correct tools and resources. So, yeah. Right. And I mean, the reality of it is, you know, anyone that has spent time online or on social media has some experience, I think, at one point or another, something maybe not so appropriate popping up. Or, you know, I know my husband, you know, we joke about it today, but several years back, we were, I forget what, we were trying to look up a church. We typed in, it was my husband typed in Woodside Bible Church or something like that. And some crazy site pulled up and he literally jumped out of his seat and he ran to me and said, you need to go take care of that because I don't even, I can't handle what's on the screen. And I was like, why are you throwing me into the weeds? Like, what are you, you know, and, and it was this porn site that popped up and he was just trying to look up. So we all know that these kinds of things can happen pretty easily too. And you know, like on YouTube, you're watching one video, the second video automatically goes and starts playing and you really don't have control over up. So I think that, you know, this kind of a dialogue of those kind of things can step into this a little bit more with eyes wide open and, a, and an ability to do something, you know, and empower um, ourselves and one another to step into this and, and be a part of the solution, you know, and thus, yeah, cup of hope. I love that. In fact, I'm going to have a sip of mine right now. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, so if anybody that is participating has any questions, again, please feel free to answer those in the question pane or in the chat, and you can go ahead and message me, Kendra, directly uh, or send it to everybody. Um, but to get started with our first question, I think the, the question is, is who is vulnerable? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. That is a very good question. All of us can be vulnerable at one point or another, right? But, but our kids are, our kids are completely, you know, vulnerable. Um, I think Tracy was saying, you know, we've got four kids at home. I have three kids at home that are younger, nine, uh, 11 and 13. And, you know, I, I think that they are at a point where there's increased levels of vulnerability right now because they are home and they're online so much more than they ever, ever have been. Um, I was at home the other day, just, um, doing some homeschooling and I had one set up on watching a I think it's Khan Academy like a math video on YouTube and then my other one was working on my uh, our other laptop uh, doing some research they were reading articles on some topic I can't I can't remember exactly all the details but then I got a phone call and it was a work phone call so I had engaged in that dialogue and it was like a good 15 20 minute conversation I'm sitting there and all of a sudden I look around and my kids are no longer at the desk at the table <laughs> but I look up and they're in the living room on their iPads like within 15 minutes of just getting this phone call I get distracted I'm not even gone that long and before you know it they're in the other room on their iPads mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. you know so these kids are vulnerable and um, it's sort of like the analogy I like to make is like when you travel to a new city, so let's say New York City, because that's a bustling big city, right? And you're with your family and, and all of a sudden, like you turn around, you're like a kid, you turn around and you turn back and now everyone's gone. And so you're like by yourself now trying to navigate in this big city full of people you don't know. And so that increases your vulnerability, of course, because now it's just you're a lone man, a lone person and you're young and you don't know what you're doing, but yet your, but your senses, your, are, your survival senses are heightened, your adrenaline's rushing and you're alert and you're careful and you're trying to figure out how to get out of that situation and get safe again and find your parents, find your adults, find the people you were there with. But like when you're at home, these kids and they, they're on their iPads or on their devices, and they enter into some sort of community space where there's tons of people they, they don't know. It's like as if they're in New York City navigating by themselves, but the difference is in the city, they know that they could potentially be in danger. Right. At home, right. 
see. Your parents are like in the next room, you know? Yeah. So and to add well, to add to that, to even add an extra false sense of security, they could think they know everybody in that um, room because you yeah. might have a boundary that says you can only have your friends in this particular app or in this particular Zoom video or whatever it is. Well, there's one one way is they somebody just needs to get one person to include them and they're on that friends list, and they're like, oh, John, oh, okay. And then, well, if Susie knows John and Keisha knows John, then I probably know John and I'll include him. And that person kind of just stays dormant until they have an opportunity um, where they want to pounce. And that could be your child could say, oh, I'm so bored or I'm so mad at my mom or whatever it could be. And then they come in and say, oh, guess, you know, what's up, what's going on? What's what, you know, why are you upset? Or And start building and building that trust with a person who they think might be a, a student or a classmate who in fact is not in some you know predator yeah I'm glad you said that because that's right like we are vulnerable but you kind of expose that vulnerability a little bit by making a comment that you don't even think is right. an issue at all mm -hmm. so yeah. it's, it's like it's easy almost. Yeah, I was and I would definitely agree with that like just or even just like low self-esteem um a lot of people uh, a lot of youth like questioning their sexual orientation um just looking for uh like validation and community via social media or whatever it is or maybe they are having problems at home or difficulty in school and they're just you know venting about it on you know their instagram snapchat facebook um and predators see that as an opportunity like oh this this child really hates being at home. So I'm gonna say, you know, oh, well, maybe you can't hang out <laughs> with predators uh, currently, but they're, they're building that relationship right now. Right. And, and they're patient. Trust. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, and they're they have patient. all the patience in the world now because they <laughs> can't um, meet up with anyone. Well, we hope to get to them, but, um, yeah, they have all the time in the world right now to build that rapport and build that trust, build that relationship. And, um, and I think that's a misconception people have about traffickers is they think that there's only kind of one way to look at a trafficker or even um, just imagining what they would look like to you. And it's not just somebody really, really super scary looking on the other side of the screen. And it's not going to just happen in an instant. It is going to take time because traffickers are incredibly sophisticated. And that's why we need to be sophisticated in our approach because um, it's very complex. And to, and to have the conversations with our children in a mm -hmm. safe way, say, look, it's OK um, not to scare them, but it's OK for us to be able to have these conversations to talk about who are your friends with online, what kinds of information mm -hmm. are you sharing, um, are you know are you sharing things you know that you shouldn't be because they, they automatically think oh yeah I'm like one thing my daughter always says well I didn't tell them where I lived and I didn't tell them where I went to school no but if you are telling them that you you know rode your bike down Kroger on Silver Belt you know what I mean it's like okay they can kind of figure your location or your what school you go to or something like that and you're giving right and you're giving them clues for them to then look it up and say oh yeah i'm your friend remember i was at the, you know the tennis court or at this fat football game or whatever it is and even though right now we are shelter in place um as we said you know there's going to be a day in which we're all going to be able to leave right and there's going to be a day when all of our kids like go out and hang out with our friends and we want to know which friends that they're going to hang out with right because that could be a great opportunity for them to say hey yeah why don't you meet me up at the mall we could finally go to the mall you know you just don't know you made me think of uh, like when you said you know um wanting to get out like people finally like after the shelter and will be able to get out and may potentially just get a little overly excited and be willing to meet somebody i think on the inverse, when you think about like during this shelter in time, like there may be kids that are in home situations that are really uncomfortable and that actually being home more now can cause more emotional distress, more instability, more pain, more, you know, and so 
um, when you think about vulnerability, I mean, there's some levels of heightened vulnerability there, which is having to be home and having to be around maybe some people that may not necessarily be the nicest or most encouraging, like maybe your teachers at school or those, you know, your friends. Um, so that sort of is another level of vulnerability that can happen, you know, like, so just having to be home all the time in and of itself can get yeah. Being lonely and isolated, you're seeking wow. that, that community online. Mm -hmm. And you make a decision um, like to say something that maybe you wouldn't normally say, or you mm -hmm. know, that, you may also just be a very kind human being that wants to help during this time. You feel that you're feeling for people, and so you're sort of willing, you're kind of giving a little bit of yourself that maybe you wouldn't otherwise, and that could be another vulnerability as well. You know, right. So, so there's, adults, there's a lot of... adults are vulnerable. Women are vulnerable. It's not just children. It's not mm -hmm. just yeah. our young kids. It's not just our high schoolers. It's our 19 year olds. It's our 21 year olds. It's our 25 year olds. Um, you know, coming out of college, you're still in college. Our college age um, population is vulnerable. Um, you know, you have this sense of your, um, you know, what's that word when you just feel like, what is it called? It's on the tip of my tongue, you know, when you just feel inevitable, you know, like you just feel like no one can hurt you, right? And so you're like, I'm 22 and what can that, you know, no one can hurt me. I'm behind my computer and I'm bored and isolated and I'm going to have this conversation with, you know, whatever mm -hmm. people, you know, you have to be aware no matter what age you are, because everyone's vulnerable, just like Hannah's example in New York, that could be me as an old woman. <laughs> And it could, you know, and it could be, you know, anybody. It could be our males. People don't talk about it, but our boys are vulnerable, um, you know, just as, well, and, you know, our LG, um, you know, TQ, all that, um, you know, area, they're vulnerable. I mean, um, we just, we have a, we have a people in our society that we don't like to talk about, you know, and they're vulnerable and that's why they're vulnerable. And, um, you know, we need to give them yeah, hope. I like that you brought that up. Yeah. So, there's, so let me ask this question from one of our audience members um, who is joining us, and she's actually drinking a coffee substitute, we added. But um, uh, she has a concern with her sister. Uh, she follows and lets people follow her that are friends of friends. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Julia says that, you know, you never know if people are who they are, um, but they claim to be Christian, so she thinks it's okay. Mm -hmm. What would your response be to that? So I, I would say definitely have a conversation with her and say that it's actually not okay. How old is this sister? Because that, you know, I, I would say it's absolutely not okay. Because if you, you don't know this person, you don't know what's happening on the other side. At least that's what I told my daughter. My, I had this situation with my daughter. So She's she 19. And what's that? She's 19. Her sister is 19. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, she has a best friend who they're in church and they're Christians as well. And she, her best friend has two friends that want to, to friend Lucy, my daughter, and text her and get her number and all that stuff. And my daughter came to me saying, oh, this person was trying to friend me, but I think this is, this is my best friend's friend and they're close and they met at church. And I just told her, I said, no, that's not okay. Because if you can't tell me, you know, anything about that person, if you can't tell me what their favorite color is, and if you can't tell me any details about that person, then you shouldn't be friending anybody that you can't tell me at least one detail, you know, and I knew she couldn't give any details of these friends. So I, I would, I would, that would be what I would err on the side of, I, I just wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that for myself as an older. Right, and we have to be careful yeah. too, because remember, I don't know, what was it about um, a year ago when there was um, um, Michigan State Police and the FBI, they did this sting and they used um, the children's pictures, you know, it was basically to go after uh, missing children. And in that um, initiative that they did, they actually found three kids who were, um, you know, who were actually trafficking, right? And they found that it, a pastor was one of the ones who had trafficked one of the kids. And so we have to be aware that our Predators are could be a pastor, could be a teacher, could be a coach, could be right. a neighbor. So even if um, you know, even while you um, are bringing people on your social pages that you may know or has a friend that 
that knows knows somebody uh, just because they seem safe doesn't necessarily mean they are so with anything when you go down the street and you talk to somebody you're not going to go talk to a stranger you're going to um, you know, you're going to want to get to know the person before you go to dinner with them or go hang out with them. We should just use common sense. A lot of this is common sense is just saying, hey, you know what, um, where do you live? Who are you? And who who do you hang out with? And what are some of your philosophies? You can have these conversations. She's 19 years old. She can have a conversation back and forth with them. And then we got background checks. You know, you can look people up. You can just do your due diligence on people if you don't know them, if you don't have, you know, it used to be you grew up with somebody, you knew their family and everyone was in these neighborhoods. And now mm -hmm. we're all moving to cities and moving to different places and getting to know people. Uh, we need to do our due diligence, no matter if we're doing it for a five-year-old or if we're doing it for a 19-year-old sister or for yeah. ourselves as a 40-year-old. I do believe we have responsibilities to do due diligence with our relationships. Yeah, I'll say, um two things real quick, like, and especially 19 year olds, I think, um, well, even just in today's world, it's it's so tough for kids because having followers is such a big thing. Like mm -hmm. that's how you like get your, mm -hmm. like everyone wants to be, you know, a YouTube, a YouTuber and have all these followers and it's such a trend right now. So it's hard for kids to really limit that friend list, um, but it's so important. And especially when those mysteries are private messaging you, um, but um, even just with uh, the 19 year old, like that 18 to 20s um, age group, like a lot of a lot of even dating these days has gone online and all these dating apps and mm -hmm. um, really mm -hmm. doing your due diligence in vetting <laughs> or figuring out right. who this person is, you know, because they have it eventually be with this person and maybe have a relationship. What kind of can you do before you meet this person? Uh, I'm losing you a little bit, Emily. You're getting a little bit broken up there. Yeah, but I think Emily, you were you were really backing what Tracy was saying, oh, which I doing the bedding, oh. right? You were talking about really yeah, uh, like for sure dating. Yeah, I mean, there's a difference. There's, I think there's a difference between followers and friends, right? Like, what are yeah. we talking about? Like, if we're talking about Instagram and we want followers of a post that we're doing, then there's a different sense of what you're going to post. Don't per post anything personal. Don't, you know, do these DMs or private messages with people. But if it's Facebook or if it's, you know, something a little more personal or a dating app, then you need to do due diligence with the people you're interacting with. So each each um, social media piece has its own boundaries you need to put it and be aware about who you're dealing with. And I just want to give everyone permission to say no. That, right. you know, uh, quite honestly, I think that we're allowed to say no. We're allowed to not friend our friends' friends. I, I, I'm just going to say that straight up. You know, whether you're 40, 19, 5, you have the right and you have, you, I want to empower, you know, us to say no when we feel like we need to say no. Um, but if you don't want to say no and you want to say yes, then definitely do your vetting and be smart about it. Think twice. That was that's the other thing that I'm always seeing people is like just think twice before you actually do something, especially on that before you post something, you know, think twice. It's like squeezing toothpaste out of a toothpaste tube and then saying put it up. You can't put it back in, right? I mean it's, I just that's I just want people to know that they can say no and that's okay. And then if yeah. they do especially especially for women and children because we're we you know we're kind of groomed in a way to please people and to always say yes you know and so we have to be extra cautious because that's our um that's what we 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 want to do we want to please people we don't want to upset people and we won't hurt anyone's feelings but saying no may hurt someone's feelings but you need to you need to be able to protect yourself and feel good about that. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So you guys have covered a little bit of this, but just to be more specific, who and what do we need to be aware of and what are the risks? Welcome back, Emily. Yeah, <laughs> good to see you back. Good to see you back. Can you hear us, Emily, are you on? Okay. You can hear us. You can't hear her yet. 
Yes. So, um, yeah, so who and what do we need to be aware of and what are the risks? Shelby, do you want to take that or I don't. I feel so there's as we've been talking about, there's online predators and there's people that we need to be looking for that are obviously taking advantage of the increase in technology, uh, use of technology in this time. But I think it's important to also point out, I think this kind of already been said, but looking at familial ties and looking at people that we already know. Um, I think it goes really overlooked because we're looking for that stranger danger and we're looking for the big scary trafficker because um, we think that we know exactly how they're going to act and look and stuff. But um, it could be somebody that you know, it could be um, a pastor, it could be somebody that is a neighbor or just someone who already has a tie directly to your family. And obviously we're quarantined, we're not out as much, we're um, in our homes, but I think it's a good point to bring up too of when you're checking in with people. If you know of maybe some kids that are in a situation that um, is not a happy home life, that there could be abuse going on, I think it's important that we're checking in with people to do our part in um, whether it be reporting or just making sure that there are kids that are okay with where they're at right now. That's a that's a really good point. Right. I love that. Yeah, that's huge. Mm -hmm. uh, because, right, you know, because, yeah, well, I was going to say, because for them, school is safe or right. sports team that they're on is safe or the after school job they have is safe or maybe the caregiver is safe. Right. Um, but now um, there are statistics that show that during times of recessions or during times of stress in a family life such as this, um, child abuse does increase, you know, um, and it's your family members and you know, you, a lot of times you hurt the people you love the most, you know, and we have to be aware that uh, to watch for these signs, you know, and, and be aware of it and um, keep your keep your guard up that family members could be doing this too. Right, like, you know, I, I'm always talking about like the manipulator or, you know, the exploiter or the trafficker. Um, just like you guys were both saying it's not like the person that looks like scary like a scary person who's going to hurt you you know but oftentimes when you think about manipulators um they're oftentimes the nicest people you'll meet the nicest people the ones that are maybe seem like the most relatable the one that's always paying attention to you and makes you feel special makes you feel like you're the only person in the room you know, or online, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always watching out. Like, I think Tracy, you, or maybe Shelby said this, but just watching out for the signs, you know, paying attention to like, if somebody, if somebody is asking you for things that you're like, that's just not normal. Because that, that, that happens. And when you realize, okay, that's just not normal. Pay attention to that. If someone tells you something like, they're gonna give you something that seems too good to be true, I'm telling you it is. If someone tells you, you know, to keep this a secret, the first thing you need to do is tell. I'm just saying, like, it just seems, it doesn't, it's not always very intuitive, right? Um, you're not thinking about, almost, you're almost not thinking about it, but when someone, someone will, at some point, what I found is that there's, at some point, something turns. In an in interaction of some sort, there's a turn that happens and you may have that slight voice in your head that says, wait a minute, listen to that voice. That is one of the things that I, I'm always trying to talk to my kids about and training in them to listen to that voice. Cause there's some, there's that turn, something that happens that might turn in a direction that you're not, you're like, something stops you, pay attention, always listen to that. And it's okay to stop in that moment and come and get an adult and say, hey, what does this mean? I don't really understand what this means. And that it's okay to right. do that because it may prevent something for instance one of the things that um that happens very easily is someone will say oh send me a cool picture mm -hmm. and then you mm -hmm. might send a picture that may be a little bit that someone can judge right um an, an image of themselves an explicit image something like that and then once that's in somebody's hands and they could use that to then coerce you to to send more pictures and to become uh more 
egregious, you know, in, in nature, mm -hmm. um, to videos, to whatever, and you, they then use that mm -hmm. material to mm -hmm. uh, take advantage of you. You know, it, it, but it's like sort of a slow fade because you're interacting mm -hmm. with this person, so cool, mm -hmm. you know, and then all of a sudden there's that turn. There's always a turn. There's always mm -hmm. something that switches that then all of a sudden the text messages start changing, the emails start changing, the interactions start changing. Mm -hmm. That's when you want to like listen to that voice. You want to have these conversations with your kids about that turn and what happens in your gut like when you have that catch you know mm -hmm. that that it's okay that you need to tell my daughter has stopped in the middle of you know doing something like she was um someone sent a text that was interesting I, it wasn't anything like sexually inappropriate but it was like get these cool colorful bubble texts blah 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 i don't know it was like this weird thing so she came running to me and said i don't really understand what this is you know, and I said, oh, it's one of those chain messages, whatever, just delete it. And so she did. But that's what I want to encourage. Like, even as a 44 year old, like, I know I've received some stuff where I'm like, uh, that's really weird. What does that even mean? I don't even get that. Delete. You know, I don't, I don't even want to explore those, those weird kind of standout messages. Right. But you know, you know I mean? Hannah, but Hannah too, you know, it's like they test you, they'll test the kids. And yeah. before that turn, before that turn, to see if they can get away with things, to see if the child or the person is um, is um, intelligent in that area, you know, what I mean, is aware in that area. Because you know, my daughters come to things with me, and and I'm like, wow. She goes, I only knew that because you talked to me about that. Otherwise, I wouldn't have brought that, you know. But that kind of made me think. Well, now that other person, he's because I said, well, th this is how I want you to respond. And the way that I chose my words, that other person's going to know exactly that, wait a minute, this is that child, this is something else, you know what I mean? And it's like, they're gone, you know what I mean? So it's like, they're going to put testers out there, they're going to put feelers out there. It's not going to happen just, you know, uh, so like Shelby has said, and Emily has said, it's not going to just happen like overnight. Okay. And yeah. point in which they're going to say, oh, I love you, or here's a phone, only talk to me, or they don't love you is like, I love you. And then that point will go towards either isolating them from everyone that they love or using something to bribe them, like Hannah said, like a picture or to say something, you know, I'm going to tell all of your friends or this is going to go on all of the, all the friends are going to see this or you accidentally, you know, you, you shared a vulnerable secret and now all of a sudden they're going to tell everybody and blast if you don't provide that naked picture or you don't um, say things they want you to say because they're going to video it and sell it um porn hub or something you know and so there's so many ways that you can get entrapped and even um you know and, and it can happen so easily so quickly yeah that's a really good point it's a bit like i said it's a very slow fade it's like they slowly test and groom and figure out how far they can go and you know it's it but as soon as you feel that little slight turn off you know um and so, it goes back uh, to what we, I was going to say, just one thing, it just, it goes back to what we said as women, as children, we are not so much trained to, to believe what we are feeling. And it's important as parents, I mean, and even if your kids are older to start laying down, you know, and saying, Hey, look, you know what? Um, it's okay. Um, you know, like, for example, we tell our kids it's cold outside, take your jacket. Right. And then the kids are like, well, I'm not cold. I don't want to take my jacket. I don't know what you're about take your jacket we are now implementing the a system in which they can't trust their own feelings right so if they can't understand that they know what cold is right then how can they understand how can we trust them to understand anything else so it's, it starts we unfortunately groom with good intentions early or like give your uncle a hug give him a hug he's come in the door i don't want to give him a hug well you got to it's your uncle so like we unfortunately we unfortunately over the past have allowed um, situations in a way to form and that pe the children or women or vul our vulnerable people uh, feel like they have to do it because that's what we were told to do, you know, to be polite, even though it, it's against our gut. 
even though it's against what we want to do. So I think we need to just reevaluate how we and allow our children to be able to say, mom, I don't want to hug Uncle Joe or mom, I know I'm not cold. I'll carry my jacket. I'm not going to wear my jacket. You know what I mean? It's like we have to give them permission to learn how to understand, um, to trust their own instincts and feelings. Mm -hmm. And that they'll be listening mm -hmm. to you. That's the other thing. And that when they say something, you will listen to them. Right. Like my daughter, for example, like and I'll never forget this because this is, this happened so many times. She's very strong, very strong, stubborn, you know, strong-willed, and she was all she always runs warm. Okay, and so it was really cold out. I mean, really, it was like one of those. I think the kids stayed home from school because it was like freezing, and they were advising everyone stay in. She was like, I want to go outside though. I want to go outside. So I'm like, okay, put on all your gear and go out. So she put on all her stuff. She wanted to go sledding. She went outside. I said, you know, just be careful because it's really cold out. As soon as you, maybe if you don't, if you start to not feel your nose, maybe you should come in and thaw out. But that's whatever. She was like seven. <laughs> it was just a couple of years ago. And so she went out. She put on her snow pants, the whole thing. And she went out and she grabbed the sled. She went down once, came up to the back of the house, ran inside, said, oh my gosh, it's too cold to be outside. Oh my God. And I'm like, yeah, it is. That's the advisory. That's why you don't have school today. She goes, ah, you know. I'm like, but I mean, I wanted you to be able to go out and experience that, you know? And she was like, wow, it's really cold out. And she came in and then she did crafts and it was fine staying in all day, you know? But, but it's that, it's exactly, I think that's really important. The other thing that I thought of when you were saying that, Tracy, I have to share this because it's just, and I'm trying to remember who the comedian's name, but there was a comedian, I was sitting at home one time, I don't know, my husband went to work and I was just home having some just me time, my kids were sleeping, and was just, they were younger, this was like last year, I don't remember, but I, I never forgot what this comedian said, it was a female comedian, and she was talking about, she's like, oh yeah, so we come up in a generation where you know, when the boys would chase you around, she was a girl, she was like, when the boys would chase you around and they'd hit you and trip you and push you and call you names and pull your hair, and you'd go run into the teacher and say, oh my gosh, you know, this is what happened. And then they would say, oh, it's okay, sweetheart. It's because they like you. I like it. <laughs> no wonder. I mean, yeah, if you get beat up, they like you. <laughs> right? Oh my gosh, I never even thought about that, but that's so true. Yeah. I grew up in that. I remember, I remember, I remember like, Feeling that way, I remember being chased by this boy who I don't know. He liked me, whatever, right? But that's not normal. <laughs> okay. Like we would just ah uh, chalk it up. Like, it's because he likes you. He's teasing you and pulling your hair and tripping you. Like like we're accepting. Yeah. We came up sort of in that genre where yeah. we're accepting abuse or accepting. Mm -hmm. really, that's really inappropriate behavior, right? I mean, nobody, no girl should uh, accept that. It's not okay. You know, so and, but, then, and then the boys, and then the boys have that messaging. You know, the boys have the message. Oh, if you like a girl, go pull her hair. <laughs> right. You know, so there's this, then, all these mixed signals of how do you behave when you like somebody and how do you treat them? Yeah, I mean, what were? We, I mean, it took the comedian though. Like, I'll never forget that though. I I picture her standing on the stage. Joke, kind of joking about it, but that was like her message, and I was like, that is really powerful, mm -hmm. and that's so true. Like, I just couldn't believe that I never, I never, never thought about that until I saw her. So, it, I would, I wish I could remember her name. She's really good, really. It's good. Allie Wong. <laughs> that? Oh, you looked it up, <laughs> Allie Wong. No, I just, I love her, so I oh, just knew what you were talking about. <laughs> no, I think it was somebody different. It wasn't Allie really? Wong. It was somebody else. It was wasn't Allie Wong. Else. That said oh something that was like her message. Uh -huh. I mean, what was the what was the joke? What was so funny? Well, she was just joking about like, oh yeah, when the boys pull your hair and shove you down and trip you and maybe it was Ali Wong. I don't remember, but I just I don't remember. <laughs> I, don't remember I don't think she was Asian, but maybe she was. I don't know. Maybe one of my people. I don't know. But <laughs> it was hilarious. But she was so on point. I, that message stuck. Yeah. And I thought, you know, every every girl needs, every female, every woman needs to see this because right. this is one. This is like that's so on point. So yeah. we want to take the air. Right? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Emma. I'm sorry. Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, oh, that's on your way. Oh, no. Okay. How about now? Yep. Uh, add pornography in the mix these days too. 
Mm -hmm. There's some crazy stuff that kids are watching um, on Pornhub and all other miscellaneous sites. Um, and so they see, you know, these scenes of um, sexual violence and they see how the female is responding to it and they think that, that that's what females like. And then even young girls are watching these videos and telling themselves, oh, this is what I'm supposed to take. That's, you know, normal. That's so even pornography is fueling these thoughts about what healthy intimacy looks like. Right. Yeah. And then in our music you know, and our movies, I mean, you know, it, I mean, we can have a whole segment just on the poor influences we have, we see every day, advertising, TV shows, you know, all of them, you know, we could probably do a whole segment just on that. I mean, yeah. is that, because that's exactly right, and those are even risk factors. What are we mm -hmm. listening to? What are we reading? Who are we engaging with? Yeah. What are we watching? Though, I mean, those are those side are risk factors. I think right. that's a I think that's a that's a good transition. I just want to note that um, Laura and Kathleen had some some good comments, but I think transition us into our next question really well that you guys are starting to get into. Um, one of the things that Laura said was that we don't want to be fearful or make our kids always fearful and living life, but they need to learn to trust their instincts and pay attention to red flags, which I think is a is a good statement. Um, and then as we move into what can we do to monitor or prevent, um, Kathleen noted that, uh, you know, or asked, do parents know how to block sites and only allow the kids to access appropriate approved safe sites? Um, if a child has access to the general internet, they're in danger of being manipulated without ever even knowing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is so on point. There's a lot of um, actually some pretty decent um, secure sites that you can put onto your um, all of your devices. You could also do like I think it's called I think it's called safe for your wire for your internet. You can actually put blockers on your whole Wi-Fi system. Um, but there's ones there's one that I really like that I've been researching a lot more, and that's Bark. There's, and that's been, um, they've been, I've been seeing them a lot more all over the place. And I think um, something like that is a really good system to have. Um, but even, I, I think you definitely, if you don't have a system right now, you better get one. It's pretty black and white. It's very important. It's a yes, it's a get one. The other thing is, um, this is one of the, one of the moms that, I know was talking about how she, um, all of their kids, every device in the house gets turned in, checked in. It is um, like locked up pretty much. And when it chart like at nighttime after a certain time, everything gets put away and um, they, they're getting charged. And so they're locked down and nobody can get access to them after like 7.30 PM or whatever it is. And then they can't check them out until the next, the next day or next, you know, after school. So, yeah, those are yeah, those are good though for your younger kids. But like, I have you know a 16 year old, I have a 17 year old, and I have an almost 15 year old, and it's difficult when you're dealing with the older ones because, for example, my senior is going to college next year. So I, it's just as in any parenting situation, you have to you have to provide um, the tools and the resources and trust that they're going to listen to you and implement them because. You don't, you know, you don't tell your 17 year old they can't go out like no. you, 10 year old, you know, but then you give, you know, give guidelines to your 17 year old. Text me when you're there. Who are you with? Um, this is what time you have to be home. So it's the same thing with online. You might not, they may have the full internet usage. Mm -hmm. Now you give the guidelines and you give your boundaries to that. And then that way they take it with them when they leave. Because yeah. if, you become too helicopter with them at 16, 17, when they leave, they're vulnerable because they don't have the knowledge. So I believe it's got to be age appropriate. So those types of things are perfect with, you know, when you're dealing with your elementary and your middle school, like you are, Hannah, um, exactly what I'm, dealing. I'm dealing with college entry and high schoolers. And I do have a sixth grader. So I, and I am in, you know, like that. Um, it's like, you just, you have to be age appropriate. Now I have an additional problem because I have a sixth grader who sees their older siblings yeah. doing now my sixth grader has seen things 
that I blush at that I would never allow to my older ones to see, but because she has older siblings, she's kind of like walked in on something that I is not age appropriate for her. It's okay for when you're over 14 or, you know, if you're over 17, um, even then I kind of like, uh, but you know, it's not like, you know, sexual stuff, but it's just like, you know, certain things, certain video games or things like that. Um, and so she has, um, a little more mature. I've had to have these conversations with her earlier than I would have had with my older kids because she's seeing things. So we have to be aware of that, that sometimes it's not about age, it's also about who are they around? Are they around older kids? You need to be prepared earlier. Um, you you would you maybe prepare your younger kid differently than you prepared your older kid because now your older kid's influencing your younger kid. So everything's like case by case, uh, family by family, and just the point is, is knowing the resources, which I think at the end will provide a bunch of resources. And it's like, where, you know, it's always, where can you find the resource? Where can you find these things so you can implement them at home um, and uh, make sure that you're preparing your, your children for the world without scaring them, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good point. Yeah. I'm so a so quick, question. Quick, quick question, quick question. Um, and this one's actually mine. Um, when you get, the, you know, a lot of kids think that they're entitled to privacy. And we're talking about monitoring, preventing, and things like that. What, what, what do you say to that? Okay, I'm going to tell you what I tell my kids. When you walk out the door, it's democracy. When you're in my house, it's a dictatorship. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like that concept that, you know, we're going to take each situation as it is. And you, we want, again, it goes back to, we want to prepare them to go out there. And so, again, it's like, you know, I give my older kids a little more privacy than I do my younger kids. I think privacy is important. It's an opportunity for them to test things. I want mistakes to happen while they're under my house, in my under my roof. So then I, we can then talk about it and learn from it. So if you if you don't give them the privacy, but I have all the passcodes, I have um, access to their phone at any time. We have a rule where if I walk in and say, hand me your phone, they must hand it over immediately. Um, so they so they're, uh, they understand that I can look at what they're doing um, or see what they're doing at any time I want to. And But I do give them the privacy uh, that I believe that they can um, handle, you know, and that is flexible. It moves around, you know, and if they, um, if if there's consequences too, if they do something that um, is is against our rules, then they lose some privacy. Mm -hmm. I, I will say this. I, I think you hit on the nose, Tracy, when you said the conversations. I I am constantly saying to everyone, including myself, to every parent out there, I don't care what age your kids are, whether they're three or they're 18, having constantly offering and creating, being intentional about working really, really, really hard to create spaces for dialogue, for safe dialogue about everything. You know, one of the things that I asked a parent whose father along to me as someone who I call, I would call a mentor. I asked her a couple of questions. I said, one, when you look back, what was the best thing you ever did that you're so glad you did? And then on the, on the flip side, what was the one thing you wish you had done that you didn't do? And for the first question, she said, quite honestly, I'm really, really glad that, because I'm, she's like, I'm a talker. I love to talk and I love to ask a lot of questions. So I always ask my kids all kinds of questions all the time. I was always asking, asking questions, whether they were silent or not, whether they gave long answers or not. I always just ask questions because when they're three or five and seven years old and you're asking them those questions constantly, by the time they're 13 and 15 and 16 and 17, that's normal for them. You're asking them questions because that's some, if you think that your 13 or 15 year old is going to start talking to you after you haven't talked with them when they were five or seven, you got something else coming, right? I was like, wow, that, that's really cool. That's a good point. But I will also say if you hadn't done that yet, start now. It's okay. It's never too late to start. You've got to create those spaces for conversation. It's extremely important. And the, the, on the right. flip side, answer to the question, you know, what is the one thing that you wish you had done or done more that you didn't? She said, talk to them more. She's mm -hmm. like, there's, because I can't, she said, I can't emphasize it enough. Having, and I now realize that as I'm like in the thick of it, raising my kids, like 
having those safe conversations, those safe spaces and pushing, pushing to have those conversations that might be uncomfortable or cause a little bit of a tension between you and your kids is really important. Those things need to happen. We have to be able to talk about these things. We have to, what is privacy? What do you, what do you mean by privacy? You want privacy? Okay. What does that mean? What are you trying to say? Maybe ultimately they're just saying it because they want you out of their face. They're sick and tired of you telling them what to do, but that's not what privacy is, right? So getting down to like those definitions, like what do you, what is your, what is the heart at the heart of what you're saying to me when you say, I just want privacy and like engaging in the mm -hmm. conversation about that. And what, and that that's means. not, and that's not also, that's not always parents too, because this is where like exam, example with Shelby with her, you know, she's an aunt. So if she sees that her the parents aren't doing this, these conversations, then she can have these conversations. You can have these conversations with your nephews, your nieces, your you know your cousins kids whatever i mean whoever you have a relationship with if you're you know even if their parents are doing that you know sometimes um a child doesn't want to go to their parent even though they know they can even though they know you could be communicating with them all the time but maybe they want to go and talk to the aunt about this or an uncle or uh, other safe relationships and we need to give permission to our kids to do that okay you know if you don't feel comfortable talking to me about this um, what a, can you go talk to your grandmother, your aunt, your uncle, and you know, and and having um, giving permission to our children to be able, and that to me is privacy as well. It's privacy against me, but if I know that they are going off and they're getting the advice, the right advice, you know, like people that I trust too, um, I want to support that as well, you know, and that could be that could be also a privacy, um, you, you're adhering to their privacy request. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think it's so important that parents and, and whether it is an aunt or not, um, you have this unique opportunity to have conversations with your kids that um, are going to change the trajectory of whether it's just like having a healthy sex life or having the conversations yeah. about the things that can make them vulnerable to abuse that can lead to fostering an environment for them to be trafficked later in life. And I, I hope that the things that we've talked about today are not evoking more fear, um, even the, to the point of talking about strangers versus people that you know. Um, I loved, Hannah, the point that you brought about having like, being able to think twice and having that autonomy to think for yourself. So whether it is a stranger or somebody you know, you have the presence of mind to look at it the same way. And um, I, I think a lot of that comes through conversations with your parents or a trusted guardian, uh, because if you're not, have, if the parents aren't coming and talking to the kids in a way that is confident and uh, calmly, I think that kids can kind of see through that. So when we go to talking about the resources here in a minute, um, I think it's so important, anyone who's watching this webinar right now, you're taking the time to get educated. And that's so important because if you're educated on the topic and you're confident about it, your kid is gonna sense that when you go to talk to them about it. And mm -hmm. if you don't talk about it or you talk around the topic, your kid's gonna sense that and you can grow shame and fear around topics of sex or porn or online predators, like no matter what it is, your kid will be able to feel that. So to do it in an empowering way, in an educational way that opens that door for communication between the two of you will be long lasting effects mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. And sometimes- I to add on to Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Emily. Um, in a lot of my research, I've read um, just on cyber safety that some families will even create like a family agreement or a family contract of like online rules and having your child be a part of that process and help come up with some of the rules and you know when they are in that process it's more likely that they are willing to adhere to the, those rules um i guess hannah and tracy how do you guys feel about having a family contract in your home for digital use I love that. I love that. You know, it's interesting because I, I believe in that. I believe that that's powerful because they had, they, because engaging them in that conversation to talk about that is, is not just like, I'm telling you, you have to do these things to be safe. I'm saying, let's right. all be together, right? That's what you're saying, Emily, is right to Im involve them mm -hmm. and let's create these safety rules. I love that because mm -hmm. I, another thing that I haven't done this yet, but I plan, I already have a contract building 
for my oldest son who one day, well, he's so frustrated because he wants a phone right now because all his friends have phones, but I, sorry, I'm that parent. When you start driving, for sure, by then you will have a phone, but there will be a contract, right? That'll, that'll go with it. But I love, why can't we have a contract now? I never thought about that. I love it. Well, we, I, um, we have verbal contracts. I have to, I have to be transparent. I'm an attorney. So um, we have had a lot of discussions and we do verbal agreements and we don't, I don't put it in writing because I want to be flexible and I want to make sure that because you know how uh, technology moves so fast and things and I want to make sure our intent is always on the same page and, and I also want to acknowledge their maturity. Uh, it's not so much about age for me, it's maturity because you could be, you know, my 15 year old might be 15 but I don't necessarily think she's mature, right? You know, or whatever you have. So it's like, um, and I, it's different, you know, I have rules that they all follow and then I have specific rules for each of them to, based on their maturity. Um, and so um, I, it's a constant dialogue. So I don't really have anything like set in stone. I think it's a great idea if that works for you. Um, it wouldn't really work in our household. Um, and also too, I didn't grow up like this. So it's very difficult for me to even think like this with my kids. I grew up in the military family and it was, you do this, you do this, you do this. So that's always my first instinct. And then I have to back up and my husband and I, we talk about it and I do my research and then I present it. And so I think for those of you who are watching that this isn't easy for you to do, this isn't in your family dynamic, um, you still can do it by first, you're watching this. Secondly, looking at some of the resources. And then thirdly, you just have to start these conversations while you're driving. Not, um, I find that I, I get most of my conversations with my children are usually when we're doing something else and we're not looking at each other. I know usually we be looking at each other, but with the children, I find that when I'm driving them to the football game or I'm driving them to practice or picking them up from school, I get the most talkative, uh, uh, inf I get the most information, like real information. And I'm just like, yeah, really? Okay, what's going on? You know, and they're like, Did, I can't believe this. And this happened, this happened. And that's when you can say, well, you know what? Um, so who, you know, like, for example, real quick, my son was on the football team and a boy was um, during lunch, they, um, somebody had took a snap, a picture of him and put it all on Snapchat and said that he should go kill himself, right? And so the kids saw it and he didn't say anything, but he was really upset. Well, my, when we, they went to football practice, um, Ryan, my son said, you know, the boy shared it with him. And so he immediately, when he got in the car, he said, mom, you know, this happened. I, um, I'm afraid that he's gonna, he's actually gonna commit suicide. What do we do? And I don't think if, he would felt comfortable coming to me this if we weren't having these conversations and i said okay that's what's your worry he goes well my worry is that um the, they're going to know i told and then they're going to come after me and i said okay let's th think about this so i called up the principal i shared with them what was going on and we had an awesome principal and he just took care of it right away and they contacted the parents they took care of it. the kid was suspended but um my son understood that it he needed to act really fast and in the because of these conversations we had in the car, a conversation where I, where I'd say, you know, it's important that you tell, it's important to also though, make sure that the children know that you understand why they don't want to tell and that to protect them because they will have consequences. And sometimes they're in that age group where they're like, oh, I know I got to tell, but then what are the consequences for me? And so, you know, when you have a family that you don't normally have these conversations, so you're learning on yourself, how to implement these, um, going to these resources, watching these types of things, um, and understanding that, you know, find situations in which your children feel the most comfortable and then start approaching on the subject like, you know, hey, you know, so what's going on? You, do you know, you know, like for example, with suicide rates right now, someone, you know, um, it's really scary out there that the kids are committing suicide lately in high school. And so you could broach the subject. Oh my goodness. You know, I saw this on this video or I saw this on this. What do you think? And I'd be, I'm so surprised when my kids say, yeah, you know what, mom, so-and-so said that they wanted to commit suicide. And it just comes out because you're not asking them a direct question and you're not like interrogating them and keeping them in a safe space so that they feel like you're not um, judging or or um, trying to get information from them. And then they're more likely to share. 
So we're almost out of time. Thank you guys so much. It's just been really interesting. I've been drawn mm-hmm. in and then I looked at the time and I was like, oh, we're almost out of time. But I think one of the, um, you know, if, if anybody needs to drop off, please feel free. Um, you'll get a copy of the recording after this um, and some links to some resources. But I think I think one of the questions that that we had are, are there any resources that you guys recommend? Um, again, we're going to send some people some links, but I know that you guys have some resources that you might want to cover um, quickly to, to let people know what they can do to help their kids stay safe online and through these uh, times right now. Yeah, with uh, Michigan Abolitionist Project, there will be a link to a blog post that we created that kind of just curated some resources that we've discussed with Hope Against Trafficking and then just from our own research and resources that we have on hand. We have resources that we love to mail out to people um, to resource our community, but obviously with the current quarantine situation, uh, we have the accessibility to give the guide through a link. And so this is uh, how to keep your kids safe from online sex trafficking. And it's a great, it's for parents specifically, um, but this is obviously a lovely booklet, but you can download it digitally through the link that we're providing. And in that blog post, there's also a uh, disguises card is what we would call it. And it's great for youth. Uh, we don't want to just resource parents. We also want to give resources that will cause conversations with your kids. Um, and it is probably more a middle school, high school age card, but it does a great job describing uh, the the disguises that a trafficker or the behaviors that somebody who is looking to traffic you would exhibit. And it just kind of breaks it down and is makes it accessible for your youth age child to kind of flip the light bulb on for themselves of seeing that someone might not be good in their life. Yeah, there's also another link to um, an info sheet that um, provides some tips and ideas on how to talk to your kids about um, trafficking, how to talk to your kids about um, online safety and things like that. And so make sure you take some time to look at those things. I don't want to be repetitive and, you know, talk about all the stuff that you're already going to have access to. Um, there's also an, an article that is um, uh, that was put out by Washington, D.C. FBI National Press Office that I definitely recommend you read. Um, there's some phone numbers and um, websites that you definitely want to have access to as well for resources and um, to report because if you see something say something that's not the big thing you know t- teaching your kids to tell and then if they tell you that you would have uh, resources for them and a response for them um, to do something about whatever is happening or whatever is being reported well, that will Great. get you started <laughs> yeah that will get you started thank you ladies so much and thank you for everybody who was able to attend uh, today's A Cup of Hope panel. Uh, we do appreciate your time and hope that you found it valuable. Um, once you leave today's webinar, afterwards, you'll get a survey on the presentation. We would appreciate it if you could complete that and provide your feedback. You'll also receive a follow-up email tomorrow with a link to view the recording of today's webinar. Um, so on behalf of uh, all of our panelists, uh, Hope Against Trafficking and the Michigan Abolitionist Project. I do want to thank you guys for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your evening. All I want to say is just make sure yeah. you give somebody today a cup of hope. That's thank right. You <laughs> thank you. Bye. All right, all right. End webinar.